League of Legends is a game where you ruin friendships. Boy, do I fucking hate this game. I hate this game so much, hating it has become part of my identity. It's boring, bland, and uses cliches like punctuation. It has writing like shitty fanfiction, and all the characters are pretentious pricks. And it has crap sound design. But those are my opinions, and I'm fully prepared to accept that other people can enjoy things I don't. Even shitty fanfiction. I'm going to try to not rag on the game for the stuff I personally don't like, because I'd much rather rag on it for teaching people to hate each other. Yes, I will qualify that statement. That's what the video is for. In the decades since its release, League of Legends, often abbreviated as League or as LOL, which I'm not going to do, has become extremely popular with a base of over 100 million active players. And according to the internet, if you're one of those players, you are literally the worst person. But probably not really. I'll get back to that in a bit. First, let me skim over the basics for the uninitiated. League of Legends is a free-to-play, competitive, team-based, online, action strategy game released in 2009 by Riot Games. In its primary game mode, Summoner's Rift, two teams of five players, each controlling one hero, I'm not fucking calling them champions, split up among three paths. There are a bunch of different heroes to choose from, each with their own set of unique abilities. You win by pushing through the enemy team's towers and destroying their base, a building called a Nexus, while defending your own Nexus from the enemy, defeating enemy heroes, mobs, or towers, or the neutral monsters lurking in the jungle between the paths, awards you gold which can be used to purchase items that improve your stats, and experience that levels up your hero and improves their attributes and abilities. There are a few more complicated mechanics in there, like this inhibitor thing which makes your minion stronger when destroyed, and this jerk who buffs your team if you kill him, but basically this is it, and this standard game mode has remained largely unchanged since the game was released, and it remains by far the most popular. But League of Legends doesn't seem to be known for its gameplay, or for its world and characters. I mean obviously, because who cares, they suck. No, no, I said I one of the most outstanding things that League has accrued over its 10 years of life is a reputation for having an abnormally toxic community. People constantly ask, how horrible is the player base really? Because they've seen screenshots of bullying, or were bullied themselves when they first tried it out. Many of its players are often quick to come to the game's defense, saying things like, from their experience, it's nowhere near as bad as all that, or that people remember the negative experiences more clearly than in other games because a League match lasts a comparatively long time, or that all MOBAs have toxic communities and League just has a really big audience. MOBA stands for Multiplayer Online Battle Arena, by the way, a genre comprised almost entirely of games that tried to rip off League of Legends and then failed. I saw the cesspit firsthand long ago, back in 2010 when Kog'Maw was the latest hero. Since those days, I've heard the game has improved massively on this front, with Riot taking a very active role in the battle against assholery. They encourage cooperation with an honor system that lets you award an ally for good behavior. They wrote the Summoner's Code. Oh yeah, players are called summoners because they, oh, it's stupid. A guide for how best to behave that in keeping with their writing standards is overly long, and also somehow includes a quote from Rudy Giuliani. Ugh. There's also a system for reporting players who violate said code, with punishments escalating from chat restriction to temporary suspension before reaching permanent bans, though as far as I know there's nothing stopping banned players from banned flares. <coughs> but as far as I know, there's nothing stopping banned players from just creating a new account. There's a mechanism for punishing players who ditch mid-game, leaving their teams short-handed. They also tried out this thing called the Tribunal, a system where players could review and judge other players who got reported and decide if they should be punished or not, which I'm absolutely certain was not immediately used to harass people by issuing false reports. The Tribunal was discontinued in 2014, though, for some reason. But not before Riot dumped all their judgment votes into a machine learning system trying to identify how abusive behavior even happens, so that's cool. And for their efforts, they've been able to happily report statistics like, turns out 80% of negative behavior comes from normally positive people just having a bad day, and not from people who are consistently shitheads. And, direct quote, verbal abuse has dropped by more than 40%. And that's great, I'm genuinely happy that they're doing all this stuff. And I'm genuinely happy that whatever they're doing seems to be having some effect. But there's something else I'm concerned about. Something they haven't addressed. Something they don't seem to have thought of. You hear stories about League players bashing their own heads through computer screens or beating their girlfriends during a live stream. These stories are funny and or variously horrifying, but they're nonetheless anecdotal and not really indicative of any trends. It's probably safe to say that the League of Legends community is almost certainly not as toxic as its reputation would suggest, and maybe never was. But the reputation came from somewhere, and there have been a lot of anti-asshole measures in the past, including a team among the developers entirely dedicated to combating abusive behavior. 
behavior, which I think does fairly strongly suggest that the reputation isn't completely inaccurate, and that it used to be much worse when the game was still young. Obviously, not every League of Legends player is the kind of person who tells an underperforming team member to kill themselves in explicit and graphic detail, and obviously every competitive game inevitably attracts douchebags to some degree, because competition itself inevitably attracts douchebags. But, much like how I'd encourage Republicans to consider the possibility that their political ideals might be worth examining closer if they are uncomfortable about how many white supremacists their party attracts, if the League of Legends community has become this infamous for its toxicity, if the developers have done this much to try to mitigate how horrible their player base just sort of naturally became, maybe the game's mechanics are worth examining. Maybe it's possible that something about the game itself encourages players to be terrible to each other. And maybe things like that should be studied a bit more so they can be avoided. Competition can't be the only attractor of jerks or we'd be hearing just as many toxicity stories about every other free-to-play team game. So what is it about this one? In those threads I mentioned about people asking why the community sucks, you'll find all kinds of different answers. And I think that's because there are a whole lot of reasons that contribute to a poor atmosphere. Why do people spew hate? Because they're pissed. This is known as raging. Why are they pissed? Probably because they're losing. I mean, there are other reasons, obviously, but for now let's focus on what seems to be the most common one. When someone loses in a team game, they may blame their team, and sometimes they're even right. This happens in any competitive team game, of course, but in League, teams are small and failure is highly visible. Whenever a hero dies, it gets shouted from the mountaintops by a really annoying announcer, which only adds to one's anger toward a teammate if they died, or to your humiliation if you did, and it does it literally every time. An enemy has been slain. An ally has been slain. An ally has been slain. An ally has been slain. Been slain. Been slain. Fucking got that. This compounds with the fact that it's easier to pay attention to your allies than to your enemies. A lot of the time you can't see what the enemy team is up to, but allies are always visible. When you only have four allies to keep track of, or just two in that other mode, and someone is dragging you down, you can always tell right away who it is. But maybe the most important piece of the puzzle, it's very possible for one incompetent player to lose the game for their whole team. See, when you die, the enemy who killed you will get a bucket of experience and gold as a reward, and it will then take a while for you to resurrect back at base, and then a bit more to walk all the way to the front lines again, which isn't an insignificant walk of time because the map is enormous. The enemy, meanwhile, will continue to acquire money and experience while you're gone. This means that the hero who killed you will almost certainly be a higher level by the time you make it back, making it even more likely they'll win against you again, especially if they were able to go and get better items, because items make a huge difference. An opponent being one level above you doesn't matter too much, unless it's level 6, which is when you unlock your fourth super strong ability called an ultimate, but having two or three levels more than one's enemy is a pretty significant advantage just in terms of health and damage output, even before items items are factored in. In other words, if you lose a fight, you have a higher chance of losing the next one too. This snowballing cycle can become very difficult to escape, and it can lead to one or more enemy heroes becoming overleveled that is, stronger than everyone else in the match, and also you becoming underleveled. Depending on which hero it is, an overleveled enemy can be nearly unstoppable. They'll be able to take any member of your team in a one-on-one -on -one fight, maybe even more than one of you at once. And it'll be your fault, and everyone will know it. That might sound a bit overdramatic, but this process isn't just a hypothetical I made up. It's called feeding, and any veteran League player will know about it and its dangers. I've even heard that some people do it intentionally to spite their team, but I never personally got to see that happen. I wouldn't doubt the stories, though, especially because there's literally a checkbox for it on that report player window. So, through its mechanics, the game is teaching players that their friends may be just as much of a threat to their victory as their foes. You can't really begrudge enemies for trying to make you lose. Well, I mean, you can, especially if they're employing strategies one might consider cheap, but let's not get into that hornet's nest. But allies should be helping you, and instead it's perfectly possible for you to lose entirely because just one or two people on your team performed poorly. For a comparison, another 5 vs 5 team MOBA, Heroes of the Storm, also has leveling up and unlocking new abilities, but it has no gold or items. 
and your level is shared among the whole team. Feeding is still possible, but it matters less, because the rewards a single player gets from scoring a kill are comparatively minor. You have to die a lot in order for the enemy to get enough experience from just your deaths alone that it becomes your fault that they're notably stronger than your team. Taking it even further, in many other PvP games, like Team Fortress 2, there are no levels at all, so feeding is just flatly not part of the game. I love TF2, I'd play it more if I didn't hate PvP so much and had any friends. Another thing those two games have on League is time investment. Not only is it possible for a teammate to lose the game for you, but you have to sit there watching it happen. A TF2 or Heroes match is typically over quite quickly, so if you lose the match it doesn't feel like that much of a waste of your time. But League games can take ages. They average out to around 30 minutes according to this graph, but individual matches can be very short if one team suddenly leaves or surrenders, or they can drag on for over 45 minutes, sometimes even going for more than an hour. This means that every match carries a high investment of time, and if you start to lose, which we've established can happen early on and be nearly inescapable because of the snowballing power problem, you can only get out if your team agrees that you've lost because to surrender it takes a vote, and if the vote fails it still takes a while for the enemy to stomp you because towers on their own still take some serious pounding to bring down. Maybe that's why people do the feeding on purpose thing. You might be thinking, but wait, if you start to lose, can't you just quit and try again? No, you can't. Which I mentioned earlier, thanks for paying attention, you jerk. Why doesn't anyone ever listen to me? They built in a system called the Lever Buster, and if you leave mid-game, you get punished for it. You get branded as a bad person who leaves in the middle of games. You get put in increasingly long wait low-priority queues for second-class citizens, and if you do it too much, you can even get your account suspended. And you can't even start a new game, you can only rejoin the one you left. I guess if your internet goes down or there's a power out or your baby is on fire, you just have to eat shit, you lose dodging asshole. Serves you right for having some kind of life outside your online games. So, to sum up the point, if one or two of your teammates sucks, or simply makes a few mistakes, or are just outplayed by their opponents, you can lose the whole match through no fault of your own, and you have to watch, sometimes for half an hour or more, and you can't leave or the game punishes you. I hope you're beginning to see why this game can be so frustrating, and why frustrated players may furiously profess their frustration while facing their fellows, but I'm just getting started. Feeding the snowball isn't just an unfortunate accident that can sometimes get in the way of the fun. It's kind of the whole game. One avoids the wrath of the snowball by not dying. One avoids dying through a combination of skill and knowledge. Different heroes necessitate different strategies. Depending on who you are and who you're fighting, you may be able to charge in and engage head-on, or you may have to keep your distance and skirmish. Maybe you can chase after them when they run away, maybe you really super shouldn't, or maybe you should just say fuck it and go to a different lane because you will never ever out DPS this fucking asshole before he cuts you to pieces. Why is it always crocodiles? First you gave me a fear of any water I can't see the bottom of even if it's only knee deep and now this shit. Leave me alone! Sometimes you should fight and sometimes you should run, but knowing when to do what relies on knowing what you and your enemy are capable of. The problem with that is, at time of recording, there are 145 heroes in this game. And for many of them, if you don't know how they work, they will have a giant advantage over you. Let's look at this asshole, for example. This is Blitzcrank. A friendly human. He has a rocket arm that lets him grab someone and pull them towards him, a speed boost that makes him move and attack very fast for five seconds, a punch that does lots of damage and throws the target into the air, and a giant explosion of static that does massive damage to everyone around him. All of these abilities, when used together, make a very powerful combo. He can grab an enemy hero and then immediately uppercut them to bring them close and then stun them, and then use the other two to deal lots of damage very quickly. The best way to avoid the Blitzcrank combo is to keep him at a distance and not get hit by his rocket grab. See, rocket grab is what's called a skill shot. Skill shot type abilities have to be carefully aimed, and it's possible to miss or hit the wrong target, instead of just pointing at some schmuck and hitting them automatically, like some lazy jerk-offs. If you're keeping an eye on Blitzcrank, you can get a feel for when he's about to launch his hand, and you can move out of the way. Or you can just dance all over the place like a spaz and hope he misses. But the thing is, you have to know all this about Blitzcrank first. If you don't have any idea who he is or what he can do, when you encounter him for the first time, he's got a good chance of being able to unload the whole combo right onto your face. And you'll die, and possibly start the snowball if you can't turn it around from there. So I guess if you want to know your enemy and know the strategies to beat them, you'd better get to studying, Sonny. All hundred something of them. Now to start off, I want you to read these books. I didn't pick the worst ambush predator of the lot either, I just picked the one I knew from experience. 
because I found out what Blitzcrank does the painful way. Thanks, Kurt. There are so many heroes I don't even know and have never seen before. And according to the classifications the game uses, there are quite a few who are labeled as assassins. And Blitzcrank isn't even one of these assassins. He's a tank. All of these jerks are apparently even better at suddenly killing me out of nowhere than that top-heavy brass dipshit. And again, Singed is labeled as a tank for some reason too, so maybe they aren't and the people who do the classifying just have no idea what they're doing. But wait, there's more. Don't forget about all those shiny items, because depending on what a hero buys, they may play completely differently. Not that I'm an expert or anything, but from what I gather, lots of Blitzcrank players like to focus on items that increase his spell damage, so that the rocket grab and static field combo becomes super deadly. But there's another build called Crits Crank, where instead he just stacks attack damage and forgoes beefing up the grab and zap in favor of just beating the shit out of people. Now, before any League veterans jump down to the comments to tell me that Crits Crank is shit, first, it's, I know, I know. But secondly, that doesn't actually matter for my point, which is each hero has multiple ways of building them, and sometimes these different playstyles are so divergent that they warrant different tactics when fighting against them. Grabby Zappy Blitzcrank uses his rocket grab as an initiator, but Critzcrank will probably save it for when you try to run away. In other words, after you've read up on the abilities for all 140 whatever heroes, you'd better read up on all their builds too. And while you're at it, also memorize the summoner spells and the rune trees. And of course, you'll have to familiarize yourself with the game's basic mechanics, like ability power, cooldown reduction, armor, magic resist, magic penetration, true damage, uh, execute damage, adaptive damage, what the fuck is that? Basically I'm saying that if you don't know what you're doing you die, and if you die you feed and everyone hates you. But in order to know what you're doing you have to learn all of this. This is what we call an entry barrier. The bigger the entry barrier to something, the more people who try it will get turned off and go away. And they won't give you money, which is bad if you're a game developer. Now, you don't have to learn literally everything before you start playing, of course. I was just being hyperbolic. But the less you know, the more likely it is you'll be blindsided by some jackhole you've never heard of and start a snowball. When ass clowns tell new players to stop whining and get good, they seem to have forgotten that getting good means sinking many, many hours into practicing this game's finer points. And of course, just knowing about Blitzcrank's combo doesn't make you automatically good at avoiding it. You also need to, like, actually, you know, get good. It takes a staggering amount of time to become familiar enough with the game's mechanics and at least enough of the heroes, to the point that you can be generally trusted to not get killed by not noticing the tower drilling a hole in your forehead or trying to fight Baron What's-His-Name on your own. And until then, you're a noob, and noobs are poison. Noobs don't know what they're doing, and they'll die, and they'll feed. And I'll lose the game, and it won't be because of me, and there'll be nothing I can do about it. It makes me very angry, and it's all their fault. Why are they such fucking noobs? Why does this game keep putting fucking noobs on my team? I wonder why people playing this game for the first time keep getting the impression that the community is toxic. Not that I'm trying to say that I'm at all good at this game or anything. I freely admit I'm terrible at it. I am one of those noobs. Like I said, I have no idea what over half of these assholes do. I played this game for at least 20 hours back in the day, and I achieved the lowly rank of 16 or something, which isn't even high enough for the... Wait, what was the level requirement on that thing again? Oh, thanks. That's just, wow, that's fucking brilliant. So helpful. Fucking love this game. Over 20 hours in, and that's only barely scratching the surface, according to the people who play in ladder games or whatever they're called. 20 hours is longer than it takes to finish most games. I remember some tit boldfacedly stating, the game doesn't start until you're level 30. So apparently the entry barrier that stopped me back in those days was in fact just the shadow of an even larger entry barrier. And I guess beyond it is some kind of above level 30 nirvana. And I was stuck in a dank hollow filled with pre-enlightenment douchebags who were concerned with silly pedestrian things like winning. Get the fuck out my face with that shit. If above 30 ranked play is so fucking great and apparently so different from this pre-30 garbage dump I'm stuck in with all the other dirty plebs, why is the garbage dump even here? How has it not been excised by now after 10 damn years? 20 hours of not fun I spent and I was expected to spend another 40 or 50 before I could join the big boys club of not being a filthy noob that everyone hates automatically. And there were fewer heroes back then too, so the entry barrier used to be smaller than it is now. They're still adding more though thankfully they've slowed down in recent years, but every new one still makes it even harder for new people to enter. The supermassive, super colliding, super entry barrier is only getting bigger as time goes on. One day it will blot out the sun. One day it will destroy us all. Unless you can dodge its skill shot.
So what all this adds up to is an environment in which new players are set up to fail and every failure is potentially disastrous for everyone. This, I believe, is the primary reason why League of Legends is made almost entirely of stress. It's also made of cliches, but that's unrelated. This is the environment that greets people trying the game for the first time. This is the environment that every novice grows up in. Now I expect lots of people are going to see this and go, what are you talking about? I don't feel stressed at all. I have fun playing this game and I really enjoy the complexity. Frustration is subjective, isn't it? All this stuff you've been whining about isn't really a problem for anybody except you. Your opinions are stupid and wrong and that's why nobody ever wants you around and you should kill yourself. Yeah, I'm getting to it. Alright, fine. Subjective. I'm sure not everyone will get frustrated having to sit on their ass for an entire minute doing literally nothing when they die in this game. Here's the thing, though. I kind of imagine that most people will. Yeah, frustration may be subjective, but can we not say that Portal 2 is worthy of being called a blanketly less frustrating experience than, say, Dark Souls? Can we not predict that some mechanics will be, in general, more or less frustrating than others to most people? Of course we can, it's easy, they teach that shit in school. Pain is subjective too, since only you can feel it. But you won't tell me it's unreasonable to predict it'll hurt when I show a fucking crocodile up your ass. Subjective isn't the same as arbitrary or random. Any expert on an art form can tell you artists use certain elements specifically to evoke particular subjective emotions. This is a B. The next note is a C. And the job of the C is to make the B sad. And it does, doesn't it? <laughs> Composers know that. If they want sad music, they just play those two notes. Anyway, what was I talking about before you interrupted me and made me question my ability to think critically, which messed up my whole identity? Right, Dark Souls. The particular stressful element of concern here is punishment. That is, what the cost is to the player in terms of time and progress when they reach a failure state, as defined by a cool guy named Seamus Young. Link in the description, read the article, it's interesting. When you die in Dark Souls, quite a few things happen. You resurrect all the way back at the last bonfire you rested at, all the bad guys come back, and you lose all your money and experience. The stuff you lost becomes a big pile where you died, and you then have to make it all the way back there and pick it up again. And if you die again before you pick up the pile, all that stuff is lost forever. Fun. That is a lot of pressure to not die. In other words, a high cost for failure. That pressure is a large portion of why lots of people get very mad at Dark Souls, and why the game has earned a reputation for being ultra difficult and ultra stressful. The punishing mechanics make people stressed out. This is the point I'm making, remember it. Punishment is what Dark Souls is known for, and I bring it up because League of Legends has it in droves too. Punishment for days. Punishment all up in here. So much punishment I should make a Punisher joke. I think I would go so far as to argue that League is the more punishing of the two. That it has the higher cost for failure. Running all the way back to where you died in Dark Souls can take a very long time and carries the added risk that you'll die again and lose all your shit. But you are at least still playing. You're engaging. You're focused. Whatever anger you may have felt from dying is being channeled somewhere. But in League, when you die, you have to wait to respawn. Somewhere between 10 seconds and just over a minute, depending on your hero's level. The stronger you are, the longer you have to wait, and the only thing you can do is muck about with your inventory. Or, <clears throat> use the chat. This is important. For that entire time, you have stopped playing, and have just failed your team, and have access to a megaphone. So that's a great combination that I'm sure does not at all encourage fits of verbal abuse directed at other people. And speaking of failures, you don't even have to die either. Just being forced to retreat at all is still a giant time waster, because you have to walk all the way back anyway. There's a spell that you can use to teleport across the map, and it has a massive cooldown because they understood such an ability as like having the fucking BFG in terms of usefulness. But it isn't just major setbacks. Unlike Dark Souls, which keeps its punishment mostly confined to when you get your shit pushed in, in League, the importance of gold keeps the looming threat of failure nearly constant. Your gold is always gradually accruing, but if you ever want to actually afford anything, you need to mug people. Killing a minion gives you some bonus gold, but only if you score the final blow. If your team's minions or one of your allies gets the kill, you get nothing. This is actually an extremely narrow window that requires correct judgment of a lot of variables at once. Most heroes don't attack all that quickly. So if you misjudge and don't do enough damage, your target will probably die from something else in the second or two before you attack again. 
To get the reward, you have to correctly keep track of how much health a minion has, how much damage you do, the time it'll take for your attack to land, such as if you have to walk over to them or if your projectile isn't instant, and whether or not they'll be hit by something else first. To throw even more wrenches into the mix, your damage goes up as you level up, and depending on what hero you're using, you might be buying items or using abilities that increase your damage. And also, uh, minion health goes up, uh, over time, I think? Maybe? But it's not clear by how much or at what rate. Uh, this is why I played Singed a lot. That guy doesn't give a shit about this shit. I know this sounds like I'm blowing this way out of proportion. Obviously nobody gets actually mad at missing the last hit on a minion. Unless they're me. But let me put it this way. Every minion you fail to kill means a lump of cash you could have gotten if you hadn't cocked it up. Even worse for enemy heroes you let get away. This is something you'll be doing constantly if you're in a lane, especially if it's still early in a match. And remember, early game is extremely important because that's when snowballs start. This is the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay loop of every single game. The baseline, the bread and butter, and it contains both the long and impotent weight of death and or the long eventless walk of shame back from base, and the repeated failure or risk of failure to get reward money from minion kills. And let's not forget you'll often have to juggle all this with tangling with the enemy hero or heroes or tower, so while you're trying to get the last hit on some of these guys, some other jerk shows up and you're like, who the fuck is Nocturne? Never seen that guy before. Oh, that's who Nocturne is. Congratulations, have a snowball. What makes this a problem is how steep the slope is. More skill at these mechanics doesn't give you just an edge, it gives you a gigantic advantage because items are so powerful. Let's compare with Heroes of the Storm again real quick. Lots of talents and abilities feel a bit underwhelming individually when compared to some of League's items. Oh holy shit, gain extra movement speed for three whole seconds. Amazing, oh my god. It's like Christmas morning. They may not be as rewarding to get as this item that basically doubles the damage my spell does and also makes it slow enemies down, but that's the point. They keep the playing field much more even and much less stressful. Even if the enemy team has their next trait tier unlocked and I don't, it isn't that big of a deal. I could still turn this around. Oh, also forts have healing wells and minions drop candy that gives you some health and mana back so you don't spend half the damn game running home to refuel. That's nice. In League, even slight mistakes when judging minion health can mean the difference between getting the item you really need when you jump back to base or being 40 gold short. And you have to decide, do you sit there and wait for like 30 seconds or more? 30 nail-biting seconds of killing nothing and not getting more cash or experience and leaving a tower undefended, all while knowing you'll still have to walk all the way back on top of that? Or do you forego the item that triples your damage in favor of getting back to the action faster, but risking not being strong enough to fight off the enemy? And who knows how long it'll be before you can take the time to come back here to get it later, because every visit to the base takes ages and ages. Ugh, I miss my horrible flying saw thing so much. Every moment lost can feel like a massive disadvantage, because they are. Facing an enemy two levels higher, deck stacked against you. Facing an enemy two levels higher and with an extra 700 gold to spend, you are fucked. The advantages of optimal play are so noticeable that not playing at optimal levels can be constantly stressful. And you obviously won't play at optimal all the time, everyone makes mistakes. Yeah, I'm sure middle and late game are much more about hero versus hero and big damn team fights and such, and all this laning junk is confined to early game. But if that hero fighting stuff is so important, why is there an early game at all? Why don't they just start everyone at like level 10 with like 3000 gold and get the fuck on with the killing? Yeah, welcome to fucking Nightmind, friend. This is what I meant by the great snowball being the whole game. Early game is about building your snowball. Everything contributes in some lasting way either to your own snowball against the enemy or reducing the size of the one they're building against you. Everything you do is in order to do those things, because building a snowball is how you win. Never mind that it feels horrible being on either side of one, either because you're afraid you're not rolling fast enough or because you can already tell theirs is bigger and it's coming straight at you. All the gradual acquisition of eventually immense power means outplaying the enemy takes a backseat to getting higher numbers than them, because who cares how much more skillful the opponent is if you can do enough damage with your fucking auto attack to kill them in four hits. I've seen Team Fortress 2 matches where the payload pusher team steamrolls every checkpoint the whole way, only to get stopped dead by a stalwart last stand on the last 10 feet, and then that last stand ends up holding them back for a whole 10 minutes, and the defenders run out the clock and actually win. And that shit is awesome, no matter which side I'm on.
But nah, skill at League of Legends is skill at building snowballs, and I hate it. But whatever, frustration is subjective, right? Some people like Dark Souls because it's so punishing, and they get very, very defensive about other people complaining that it's too hard, and so have become a highly insular and exclusionary community. Hey, that looks familiar. And I imagine that similar people can enjoy League in the same way, but for many others the frustration is too much, and the reward of eventual victory isn't good enough to justify it. For those people, Dark Souls is a chore at best, and serious property damage rage inducing at worst. That's what League is like to those of us who get stressed out by mistakes. This constant cavalcade of minor inconveniences piled on top of each other, occasionally punctuated by really, really big inconveniences. I'm not trying to say that everyone gets frustrated at League of Legends. What I'm saying is, I do. A lot. And I'm not the only one. For people like me, League is an unyielding nightmare of suffering. Now, if you think that these complaints must be coming from someone who just needs to grow a pair and get good, you may leave immediately, because you obviously haven't been listening. I could respond more to people who think like that, and how they promote a terrible culture of neglect and ridicule, especially of people with mental health issues, and how they're the product as well as the perpetuators of a horrible society built on lionizing the worst aspects of masculinity. But there's not really much point talking to those kinds of people, so let's just move on. A much more reasonable rebuttal, maybe you think people who are as anxious as I describe, people who don't get the high of victory after extreme punishment, should just not play League of Legends. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Hey, fellow anxious people, don't play this game, you'll hate it. Yeah, that didn't work, they're still playing it. Why are they still playing it? Please stop, why are you doing this to yourselves? Maybe it's because of the Skinner box of leveling up and getting new heroes. Maybe this one will be fun. No, not really. Or maybe it's peer pressure. That's probably a big one. Playing with just one other person you can at least vaguely depend on is such a massively superior experience that you basically have to if you want to keep your sanity. But if you don't play regularly, any friends you play with who have more time than you can rapidly outclass you in both rank and in systems knowledge. And that means, since the game tries to match players against players of similar level, being a lower level player partnered with a high level one means either bringing the level of enemy players up higher than you, which makes it more likely that you'll be dragging down your team, or bringing the level of enemy players down for your higher level friend, which isn't fair to your friend, or to the people on the enemy team that he's now war wicking the shit out of. Guess the best option is to ditch your friend, or quit your job so you can play more. Scrub. The alternative is joining games by yourself with four random teammates, known as solo queuing, which can be such a ridiculous adventure of suck that I've seen multiple people encourage muting your team the moment you begin and treating them like their AI. In order to enjoy this multiplayer game, they have chosen to intentionally avoid the multiplayer part. Nice. Nice, that's... that's great. Great job there. Anyway, anybody remember the point? The punishing mechanics make people stressed out. This is the point I'm making, remember it. Right, that. Frustrating, hopeless wastes of time are built into the gameplay, as is the possibility of losing because of an ally, all of which comes together to promote a culture of exclusion and distrust. The game itself is the heart of the problem. For all this rage and hate baked right into the game, I almost find it tempting to accuse the creators of some kind of deliberate attempt to sow chaos among the masses like a devil cult. But I know that's not really the case. I assume. Despair. Their crime isn't malice, it's laziness. So that's the middle taken care of. In part two, I'll be looking back, at the beginning, and then, after the past, looking to the future. If you'd like to try to convince me that no, really, the lore is super cool and not a heaving pile of inane self-important garbage, and everyone should see your Lowey and Vagar slash fic, feel free to leave a comment, and I will not read it.